Uh, thank you all for attending uh, the second day of the three-day set of presentations on uh, selected doctoral programs at San Diego State. Um, we're highlighting the science, uh, engineering, um, and some selected other programs like health and science education um, over the three days. Um, so thank you again for attending. Uh, it's a nice turnout. Um, two of our um, uh, very strong supporters are not able to attend. Uh, Ms. Magra uh, uh, Gridadze, the executive officer of the Millennium Corporation is uh, not able to welcome you tonight. Uh, but the Millennium Foundation has and corporation have been uh, supporters and really important in uh, initiating uh, SDSU Georgia and then these follow-up activities. And similarly, um, Mr. Christopher Anderson, uh, attache of the US Embassy, cultural attache of the US Embassy uh, had another obligation and won't be able to attend. Um, so I'd like to start um, by asking uh, Dean Gubin, Dean of uh, SDSU Georgia, to say a few few words. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Walt. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, again, I would like to welcome all of you. Uh, I see a lot of uh, familiar faces from last night. So you heard me speak uh, to the opening last night. As you know, SDSU Georgia is in uh, in Tbilisi in Georgia since 2014. Uh, in July, it's gonna be our seventh year here. And uh, we're only happy to be here and would like to continue our presence in Georgia. So this is one of the uh, uh, projects that US Embassy funded to add research component to STSU's mission in Georgia. Uh, our mission in Georgia, as you know, is to promote STEM education. Uh, we have uh, 440 students now in the program in six disciplines, uh, six majors, which are computer engineering, computer science, electrical engineering, construction engineering, civil engineering, and, and uh, chemistry, biochemistry. We have graduated 141 students from the program and we have another 440 uh, in the program, 115 of them will graduate this summer. Uh, we have offices uh, uh, on Kostava Street 5 uh, near the statue of Shota Rustavelli. Uh, so those of you who are from not Tbilisi, when you are in Tbilisi and when there is no COVID, we welcome you to, to visit our office. And uh, this has been a great uh, program. Uh, this is the third in the series of uh, research capacity building graduate education in the United States. Uh, last night it was science, today is engineering. I used to be an engineering professor in San Diego State University for many years. I was participating in the joint doctoral program with UCSD. It will be presented tonight in this program. It is my home discipline as well. And I'm a mechanical engineer by training. So I would like to welcome you as well as welcome our colleagues from San Diego that will make presentations tonight. And I want to thank all of you. And of course, I would like to thank Dr. Rochelle for coordinating all, the, coordinating all this. It's not easy uh, to coordinate this many speakers and the and of course, uh, trying to fit in the schedule of this many, in your schedule, this many speakers. I would like to thank the speakers for taking time to do this. And I hope that this results in some Georgian students to go to, United, to San Diego to study and uh, to in doctoral programs. Uh, this is the whole objective that would like to establish this bridge for research and graduate education with San Diego besides the undergraduate uh, students we have now. I hope we have a good seminar and Walt. I'm, I'm sure we will. Thank you, Halil. Um, I would just like to reiterate um, that SDSU is a uh, main campus and uh, our president is really committed to building on the excellent work that's been done with SDSU Georgia in undergraduate STEM education and the work that Dean Gubin has done uh, and expand that to strong research partnerships and, uh, and graduate education, both uh, through Georgian students joining one of our jo joint doctoral programs, uh, but also mentoring um, or helping mentor students uh, enrolled in graduate programs in Georgia, 
uh, with their research, either by doing part of the research on the main campus when we can, or um, assisting and mentoring uh, students in Georgia where when the facilities um, and, and the research uh, makes it most practical to do that. Um, so with that, and to we can actually start on time, um, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, uh, Dr. Jose Castillo, who's the director of the Computational Sciences Program at SDSU. It's recently uh, moved uh, to partner with UCI uh, and is doing great. Um, Jose, you should have access to share screen and uh, uh, I look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Walt. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, yes. I should have added that um, uh, Dr. Castillo is one of our most uh, enthusiastic and uh, proactive directors of uh, doctoral programs. And I'm sure you'll get a feeling for that in his presentation. Go ahead, Jose. Okay, well, thank you. It is a pleasure uh, to be here and have the opportunity to give you a brief description of our program and the history of uh, computational science at San Diego State. Uh, I seem to be able to get a slideshow going. Okay. Try the, um, just to the left of the slide bar on the bottom, if you click that um, first symbol after the, uh, to the left of the minus at the bottom, you should be of the PowerPoint presentation. It should, you should. I can see my, my slide, but I, it, it is not changing, so. Yeah, but I don't think you're in the presentation mode yet because we can Play see the- Play from start. Play from start. Okay, got okay, it. There you go. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, before I, I will uh, tell you what computational science is, since this is something that nowadays, uh, this is just my definition, nowadays nobody questions what computational science is, but when we started, uh, I have to give an explanation every meeting I went. And to me, computational science is an evolution of applied mathematics where you take aspects of computer science and then you work for advanced solution of problems, mostly in science and engineering, but public health, economics, and why not? But it comes to the paradigm of science, of science today, which basically right now we actually have four. So we have empirical science and theoretical science, which was the original ones, but then but computational then, science then, became Hello? Computational science became. I think there might be a. a... Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, there's an echo, but if everybody can turn their mics off, except you, Jose, um, it may help. The computational science uh, joined part of the, the pillars of uh, science, advancing uh, of science. And nowadays we are in the, the in a revolution where everything is driven by data. So basically these are the four paradigms right now. And what we do in this program is actually we combine computational and data science. So because every uh, project that our students work in has a, a data science component. And basically this, this uh, logo here or this uh, symbol uh, summarize and describe our program because we do have a, a comp an interdisciplinary framework that actually capture what we do across disciplines because we do have advanced quantitative methods, data science, high performance computing, but also this is 
connected with physical science and engineering. And the key is that we do, uh, and this describes the profile of the students that we have in our program. Our students should be able to uh, understand a problem coming from science and engineering, develop a computational model, and develop algorithms to implement that model, hopefully in a high performance computing environment. The CSRC, the Computational Science Research Center, started in 1999 at San Diego State, and the pioneer, the pioneer graduate program in computational science. It was the first PhD in computational science in the United States, standalone, and still is one of the few that is totally standalone program. Most of the programs in the country on in, is is a, a part of a other program, which is a different. Uh, uh, concept, but what we're, what we're producing is a new uh, scientist, an interdisciplinary scientist that is able to uh, work with different uh, groups, different areas and cross disciplines uh, easier than the standard uh, uh, degrees uh, had been providing training. We focus on training in practical engineering applied science, our students working industry, government, research centers, and academia. Basically, this uh, also represents how the scientific computing model and simulation interact or overlap with, these are the core uh, sciences, uh, the core areas that our students work here, bioscience, earth science, physical science, of physical and chemical science and engineering science. And one of the things that is important about our program is that the students that we take, we the students come from different backgrounds, coming from mathematics, computer science, engineering, biology, chemistry, physics. But then in this program, they built on their previous background to expand into a more broad, uh, uh, scientists. And there is uh, the curricular core areas is involved, of course, computational methods, mathematical modeling, statistics, scientific visualization, high performance computing, and scientific database techniques. So this is just a description of the center and who are the, uh, I'm the director and we have three associate directors, which you can see one is from science, one from engineering, another one from public health. And we have an advisory board that connects us with national laboratories and industry. We actually uh, provide uh, run different programs. We have the master uh, science, data science. We have a professional science master degree and our, core, our, our flagship uh, uh, is the computational science PhD program. In terms of the affiliation and the university, this is a a standalone program and a center, but we are affiliate. We have affiliation with the College of Sciences, College of Engineering, College of Education, and College of Health and Human Services. And as you can see, most of the departments are represented, in particular from science and engineering, in our program. What is the basic skill set that we actually in, infuse in the, in the training for students? Uh, our students. Uh, we want them to be able to work in team projects. And in team project, you can be the leader, but also you can be a part of the team. So the students work in both roles in the projects that they do over the course of their studies. It's interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary. They work in software uh, development so that they, they actually learn aspects of software development. They learn how to plan because this is something that is very important. and we also do a, a big emphasis in communications, oral and written communications. So for example, they should be able to explain to an expert or to a general audience in a very few words, what is the, the research that they are, they are uh, doing. And our students also have to be tool makers as much as tool users, because most of the problems today they are no be, we cannot solve with standard software packages. So we have to be continu continuously uh, developing new tools and new uh, algorithms for solving those problems. 
Part of the curriculum work areas, as I repeat, numerical analysis, scientific visualization, hyperfast computing, scientific database techniques. We do have an approach in training our students, which is multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. We also form what we call discovery teams. With, and these teams actually are science driven. It's not that you develop a tool and then you're gonna find where to use it. This is the teams, the tools are developed for projects where uh, they're driven by the science. And these are teams which are made up by faculty, postdocs, PhD students, master students, and on the grants. And we actually have particularly a, a seminar that we do for training, which is a COM 670, where we call it problems in computational science, where we actually put in practice all this, all this training with our students. And we also bring problems from industry where the students work on. We actually have a strong industry interaction. So we have a program called ACCESS, which is Applied Computational Science and Engineering Student Showcase. And that is a curriculum forum. And the students in this case, they actually uh, present the research to industry and national laboratories. And this actually is very important for us and for our students because they get internship, also they get jobs, you know, very good jobs uh, after they finish. In the access, which is a partnership that we have with industry, so we do have uh, companies will provide uh, support for this. And I, I repeat, we have team projects, it's interdisciplinary, scientific computing, software planning and communications. I have, I like to emphasize this because that actually distinguishes our program from basically all the programs that I know uh, similar. The, At the moment, we got 37 PhD students, which uh, nine and female and 20 AI males, and we have graduated 85. And last year we got, uh, we got graduated five. Uh, we have a different approach. I don't know if you're familiar with the, how the PhD programs work in the US, but we actually, uh, the majority of the university, at least the bigger programs, they admit a substantial number of students, and then in the process of the, the without the students, so they expect only maybe 30 to 50% of the admitted students to succeed. Our philosophy is the opposite. So we actually admit a smaller numbers, but we expect all of them to succeed. And very few have actually didn't uh, finish the program. We actually have a, an excellent rotation rate and graduation rate. And our students, uh, one of the things that distinguish our program is both the quality and the number of scientific publication from our students, which is actually, I need to update this, but it's probably close to 500 at the moment. And we're talking about journals, prestige journals like Nature, Physical Review Letters, uh, SIAM, you know, name it, Compu uh, Journal of Computational Physics, different journals in different areas, top journals, our students publish on there. Some information about alumni. So for example, we got about 33% of our graduates are employment in academia as postdoctoral fellow, staff scientists, teachers, and full-time faculty. Uh, we have several alumni working in national laboratories, Los Alamos, uh, SPAWAR, which is a Navy lab here in San Diego, or REACH National Lab and San Diego National Laboratory. And we got also about 5% they move abroad to work as consultant, faculty members, and to fill industrial positions. And many of our students actually work, they like San Diego, and I don't blame them, so they actually uh, want to work close by, and we got a lot of the students uh, working in, in local industry. And the remaining graduates work for various companies in California and different places, and some serving the local biotech and, uh, uh, and tech workforce in the county, which I don't know if you know, but this is one of the top uh, uh, hubs in biotech in the US, San Diego. In terms of funding, uh, our, our faculty in the last three years, and this is from last year, I haven't updated this. so. Our faculty brought 
you know, a, a decent amount of money, you know, about 9 million. And in the life, a, 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 a three years in the life a year, a little more. So we do have the main resources for a faculty come from the National Science Foundation, the Army, the Air Force, Army uh, Research, and the National Institute of Health. And by the way, this is only the faculty supervising PhD students, not all the faculty that, that, that we're counting here. Uh, a little bit about the program. The program is joined with uh, University of California at Irvine. And the way we set up the process, the students apply there. And there is a joint admissions committee that makes the recommendations and the students must be admitted to both institutions jointly. So what do we want, what kind of students are we looking for? So this is basically, we focus in STEM, which is uh, actually uh, Georgia focus as well as SDSU Georgia. So for to be admitted in the, in the program, you have a, a BS in one of the science, uh, or one of the STEM fields. We want people to have a strong background in linear algebra, differential equations, statistics, and programming in a, in a language such as C or Fortran. Okay, so it has to be a, a, not just a script language. The, those, we all do those, but there are things that you're not able to do with that. Uh, we have to, able to, have to be able to demonstrate a strong academic record of undergraduate coursework, and also be uh, capable to take advanced mathematical courses. So we want students with good skills and ability to communicate effectively. So that's basically the indicator that we have is the TOEFL and the GRE scores. We want to have the student to have evidence, evidence of potential for being a good student and that is measured by the recommendation letters, prior publications, research experience. This is something that uh, is actually becoming common nowadays that most of the students as an undergraduate level are involved in research in the US. And of course, you have to have the motivation and the interest to succeed in an advance. And because it's not enough to, to want to, to be qualified, you actually have to want it. That's actually a very important uh, aspect, if not the most important one. Thank you. And if you are more in interested, there is uh, more information here, more details, and I will happy to answer questions later on. Yeah, thank you, Jose. Um, we'll, uh, we're asking all the speakers uh, if they'll send their slides so that the students can review the information and the contact information um, uh, online later. So um, we'll, uh, we'll be requesting that. Um, that was a very nice presentation. I would mention that your list of admission criteria uh, and ways of verifying those are probably um, consistent with most of our doctoral programs. So I think uh, not everybody has presented that in, in such a nice focused way, but I would suggest the students look at that carefully because those really are the elements that um, are looked at by most of our programs that accepting PhD program, uh, PhD students. Thank, thanks again, uh, Jose, and we'll, uh, we'll have the question and answer period later. Um, our next speaker is talking, we'll talk about the four programs in, uh, in engineering. Uh, that's Dr. Garoma, who's the director of, uh, of, the, of each of the four programs. So Garoma, um, Jose, if you can quit sharing. Then... Yeah, that's what I'm trying to find yeah, here. <laughs> I, know. I, think it, I think it's at the top of your screen. Um, it is at mine. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. It's not in presentation mode yet, but we can see it. Uh, yes. How about now? Perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you, Walt. And thank you, everyone, uh, again, for inviting us to share with you uh, the SDS, UCSD uh, JDP in programs in engineering science. Uh, so in the next several minutes, I'll 
give you a brief overview. Uh, there are four programs, but they are very similar. So what I'm going to discuss is I'll give you the history of the program, uh, admission process and the progress to degree. And then I'll give you some examples of uh, JDP student projects, then opportunity for collaboration with uh, faculty at SDSU College of Engineering. And then the question and answer uh, might be you know, later on or you know, I have how many minutes? I think I have uh, quite a lot of minutes allocated to the program. So we, we might uh, go through those two as well history and uh, progress to uh, no, uh, program structure a little bit. So the uh, SDSE UCSD uh, uh, engineering joint doctoral program was proposed in 1985. Uh, and uh, the proposal was approved in 1991, officially establishing uh, engineering JDP uh, in applied mechanics. And if we look back to uh, the programs, we, we, you know, the departments which were involved in this agreement were uh, mechanical engineering science at UCSD Ames and the College of Engineering at SDSU. Now, since 1991, the Ames department at UCSD actually, they went under transformation, changing their names a couple of times. And then finally they uh, ended up with the name Mechanical Aerospace Engineering. Uh, now, because uh, as a result of this transformation, two departments actually uh, were established out of uh, this department, bioengineering, structural engineering. So as a result, you know, the original JDP was with AIMS, Aerospace Mechanical Engineering Sciences Department, which was no longer in existence. So actually this, you know, forced us to realign the program and then expand it to other departments. So a proposal was submitted to realign and expand the program in 2006. That proposal was approved in 2010, resulting in the following programs, engineering sciences, bioengineering, engineering sciences, electrical and computer engineering, engineering sciences, mechanical, aerospace engine, and then finally, engineering sciences, structural. So these programs, you know, they are, housed in the College of Engineering at SDSU, but the partner department at UCSD are in the Jacobs School of Engineering. So it's a kind of a unique program, uh, one college at SDSU partnering with four departments at UCSD. So, what are the admission criteria and uh, the progress to degree? So I will briefly go through that. Again, uh, applicant must have a bachelor's or master's degree, again, in related disciplines. Uh, if an applicant has only a master's degree, the minimum GPA is 3.0. If an applicant have a master's degree, then the bachelor's degree has to be 3.0 and then the master's degree 3.5. And also, uh, you know, again, uh, we used to require GRE in the past for this admission cycle, fall 2021, because of COVID and so on, it is suspended. I'm not sure uh, whether we will be requiring this in the future. Again, this is, uh, yet to be determined. But, uh, you know, our GRE requirement used to be, and the GRE must be taken within five years uh, for the quantitative 159, for verbal 153, analytical writing 4.0. 
Uh, again, uh, English language requirement is also there. This is pretty much set by the university, not by the programs. All uh, students who would come from uh, where, you know, where their undergrad and masters is from and institutions where English is not a medium of instruction, they need to meet this requirement. This is an SDSU requirement rather than the program. I'll, I would like to give you a little bit of, uh, you know, the enrollment history for the program. Uh, you know, for the first several years, our enrollment was low, but uh, eventually in the last, I would say, uh, you know, six, seven years, it picked up. Uh, and right now we have last year and then this year we have 49 students in the program. Again, this coincided actually the, you know, the jump in enrollment coincided with uh, our strategic hiring in the College of Engineering starting in 2014-15. We were hiring highly research active faculty, uh, providing them a startup package and, and so on. So they are hungry for uh, PhD students. This is in brief again. Uh, what is the progress through the degree program? There is, you know, our students have to satisfy a course requirement. There is a course requirement. Typically, this course requirement takes, uh, I would say, from you know one and a half year to two years. Uh, if a student comes to our program with a bachelor's degree only, then they need to take some you know additional courses. If they have a master's degree, typically the course requirement is about nine courses, which can be uh, completed in about one and a half to two years, as I said before. Once they finish the course requirement, the next step or milestone is to take the departmental qualifying exam. This is an oral exam, okay? So typically then at the completion of the coursework, and then the next step, we call it a Senate qualifying exam or PhD candidacy exam. So here, again, it happens at, at least one year after they pass the departmental qualifying exam. So at this stage, they are uh, and they have developed their research area. So they need to make a you know, propose their research plan. It is a proposal of their research plan. And then the final state is defense of uh, their PhD thesis. And again, it needs to come at least after one year of uh, the Senate qualifying exam. So overall, typically our program takes about five years to complete. So next I'm going to give you examples. So, you know, we, as I said, we have quite a lot of students in the program. So what I'm going to show you in the next few slides is, you know, is the name of a student, what is their uh, discipline, which, you know, in which program are they housed and then the title of their uh, presentation. So our JDP program, we do have an annual uh, JDP Research Symposium, which you takes place in December every year uh, since 2007. So it has been going for 14, or, uh, 14 years. So we just had that last December. So we actually had 37 uh, JDP students presenting their research. So it, it will give you a flavor of the type of uh, research we do here. Uh, I don't know whether you can read them, but just glance through them, you know. Uh, the first six students were in bioengineering. Again, you can see what type of researches are involved with there. You know, from machine learning uh, all the way to, you know, uh, modeling even uh, bioelectrical systems and so on. The next ones are in electrical and computer engineering. 
So you can glance through, you know, uh, the projects. And then the next ones, again, electrical, computer engineering, and start with some mechanical and aerospace engineering. So. Again, more, again, um, uh, you know, mechanical aerospace. This is in fact the original program with uh, EMS department. So it is the largest by far, about 50% of our students are in the mechanical aerospace, followed by uh, electrical and the computer engineering is the next largest program. And then uh, after that, uh, it is bioengineering, then the structural engineering is the next. So as you see, structural engineering, we had only two presenters. Uh, also the number of students in the program is five or so, but mechanical aerospace by far is the largest program. Now, just to give you a little bit of, uh, you know, what are the recognitions, awards our students receive? This is just in the last two to three years. You know, they have received fellowships, scholarship, travel awards, about seven, 17 of them. Best paper presentation and poster, 21. Again, one of actually the requirement uh, for our student, is they need to have a couple of publications before they can graduate you know, uh, as a lead author or co-author. 11 of them have a patent, again, with their co-advisor. And there are three who have their own startup uh, company, our graduates. And then here are where some of them are working actually, both in academia and then uh, in, you know, for big corporations. In fact, I should mention this, I am, the product of the program also. I, 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 I was admitted to the program in 2000, graduated in 2004. And uh, again, you know, I actually, I went through the full circle. You know, I had students in the program. Now I am the director of the program. And so we have a faculty at Penn State, who graduated from here, uh, University of Alabama and so on. Next, you know, I, I, I did conduct a, a kind of a, a brief survey of our faculty in the College of Engineering, asking them, are you interested in collaborating with faculty and the students, you know, in Georgia, uh, in Georgian institutions? The response was overwhelming. So I'm going to just show you, you know, what are the research areas, the topics they are working on and their names uh, and email address. So maybe you can, you know, overlaps with your research interest, you might send them an inquiry, uh, either maybe through Walt or myself or directly. A little bit about the College of Engineering. We have four departments, aerospace engineering, civil construction, environmental engineering, uh, electrical and computer engineering, mechanical aerospace engineering. And again, I, I, you know, I see that we have quite a lot of attendance. So maybe I, uh, you know, it's a good idea. I, I, you know, I decided to just show you what are the subject areas of the research topic in the College of Engineering. So I'm, I'm just giving you keywords here. Advanced manufacturing, for example, one example, aerodynamics, artificial intelligence, bioengineering, biofuels, uh, chemical oxidation, combustion, and so on. So we do cover quite uh, you know, a, a lot of areas among the four uh, departments. Okay, so these are the faculties 
who uh, you know responded with a yes. Uh, now it is not in any particular order. You know, I uh, maybe maybe that is a good idea because I'm mixing some departments, mechanical with electrical and the civil. So you can you know glance through you know the faculty name and then the research interest. For example, George is uh, in mechanical. He's interested in mechanics of non-traditional materials. Satish Sharma is a professor in electrical computer engineering. His research area covers antennas, microwaves, and so on. Sunil, a professor in electrical computer engineering. Again, here are his research areas. So th there is uh, quite, or oh, I think I re got a response from uh, 17 faculties who are interested uh, in potential collaboration with faculty students in uh, Georgian universities. Here we have a few faculty again uh, from electrical computer engineering, aerospace engineering, civil construction, environmental engineering, with uh, the research topics they are currently working on. And more faculty for mechanical, civil construction, and environmental engineering. We cover different areas from mechanical, for example, on autonomy, uh, machine learning, deep learning, linear di di dynamical analysis, and so on. Uh, in, 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 in civil engineering, for example, automation. So you can see how diverse uh, our research topics are. We have faculty in civil engineering working on automation, uh, robotics, and so on. More again from electrical computer engineering, electrical computer engineering, civil engineering, more faculty with their research area. Computational neuroscience, uh, wireless charging and uh, electric vehicle and so on. Uh, we also have a faculty in civil construction doing driver behavior modeling, transportation related human factor studies and so on. Again, some from aerospace, civil construction, environmental engineering, intelligent transportation system uh, from aerospace, combustion of instability in rocket engines, stochastic modeling of turbulence, reactive flow, and, and so on. More from electrical and the computer engineering again. And then uh, we have uh, finally one faculty from civil engineering uh, uh, doing a lot on uh, geomaterials and uh, uh, resilience infrastructures and so on. It looks like I, I maybe I might have rushed through it. Uh, so it, Walt, I might have finished quite a little bit early. Maybe uh, should we open for question and answer yeah. or move yes. to the next? Yes, I, uh, I think that would be great. Um, and uh, our final speaker uh, hasn't joined yet. So, um, so let us go for question and answer. Yes. Um, uh, Nodar, how would you like to handle this? Uh, thanks, Walt. First of all, I'd like to welcome participants of today's many seminars and would like to thank the SDSU professors, Dr. Gagaroma and Dr. Castillo for their presentation. The same request came from uh, the audience as the as it had 
happened yesterday. We need all the PowerPoint presentation file to share with the audience. And the, there's one question that came up with this. What are the financial support for the student? None of the presentation contained this information. And if we can answer this, was the tuition fee for the study? And what is the tuition for fee for the in-state, out-of-state, and international student? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Uh, Garoma, do you want to take a first stab at that? And then I may have a few things to add. Sure. So, you know, in generally doctoral programs, uh, students are supported through grants, you know, on their tuition fee and uh, living expenses are covered through grants. Again, it is a competitive process uh, you know, to get to those ones. So that's why we have this, you know, admission requirement, the GRE and so on. You know, in the past, uh, based on those criteria, faculty recruit and identify students and then they support them on, uh, you know, providing them the tuition fee waivers or paying for tuition and, and then financial support. Now, if you want to know what is the overall cost, uh, if you, I mean, um, this is for engineering, including tuition fees and so on. Uh, if you are a non-resident, out-of-state student, it will cost about, I would say, you know, from fifty-five to sixty thousand dollars per year. If you are an in-state student, uh, it will cover. It will cost anywhere from, you know, forty to. Uh, $45,000 and you know, generally our faculty cover this cost is for our student. And for that reason, it is a very competitive process to get this, you know, to get admitted into the program and then receive financial support. We do not admit a student if they don't have you know, a financial support from a faculty because they cannot, nobody can uh, pay for this. Uh, what are the typical duration of the program? Because you accept both bachelor level student and master level student. Is it for four, from four to five years? And what happens if the student cannot fit within this timeline? Uh, so again, as I said, you know, I, I gave you the milestones, department satisfying the course requirement, department qualifying exam, the Senate qualifying exam, the final defense. So the average for our students about 4.8 actually to finish the program. Now, as you said, if uh, a student comes with only a bachelor's degree, they need to take a little bit of extra course. Let us say for those with master's program, it's typically about nine courses. Then if someone comes to our program with only a bachelor's degree, we will require them to take up to 12 courses. So it doesn't really add a lot on, you know, on, on their, uh, on their uh, program of study. So they, they can still finish in you know, four or five years. And if they extend beyond that, well, there is no penalty, but you know, that it, we, we want them to finish when they are ready. We don't want to rush them through the program. So we had students who took them maybe even six years and some even seven years. So that, that, that is no uh, consequence if you stay beyond the five years. It has the financial consequences, correct? It should be covered by the, from the grants if there's extra time proposed to finish the dissertation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it is again, the faculty, okay. uh, you know, by then some of the students, you know, they have uh, very well advanced in the program. You know, they, they would be qualified to get even teaching assistant uh, positions. So we, we don't just simply say, sorry, it is, uh, you stayed beyond your time, 
uh, you are on your own. No, still we will make sure, you know, they are supported and they graduate the program. So the, the support is always there. But, you know, I think we want to efficiently use our resources. And even for the students, it is better to graduate than to get a job, a high paying job rather than, you know, <laughs> living with a student stipend. So it is a benefit for everyone. But uh, just to push them through the program, we don't compromise on the quality of the program. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one question came from the Dr. Irina Gosiridze, head of biomedical engineering program at GTU. She is asking that uh, uh, can. Uh, was the policy of SDSU related to transferring students? Can you accept other students to your programs? Can the student transfer from the Georgian PhD program to your program? And what would be a you know articulation of the courses or you know this is, uh, quality assurance related stuff? Is it possible to to have mobility on your program or not? Because uh, sometimes it's related to the advisor and to conduct the research. So does it make transfer difficult or not? No, so tr transferring uh, a coursework from a an institution outside the US, you know, might be difficult, but what can be done is this. Uh, let us say, you know, our programs are very flexible. When I say that, the two co-advisors at SDSU and the UCSD actually decide, you know, how many courses the students should take and what those courses should be. Uh, so let us say if we have a student from a Georgia University in the PhD program applies to our program, maybe the student has already taken quite a few courses there. And if admitted, we could, technically, uh, because of the flexibility, reduce the number of courses from nine, maybe to only six, or maybe to only four. So that flexibility is there. That way uh, we can accommodate rather than transferring the units you know, from another institution. Uh, Groma, if I could, um, I'd like to mention a, a couple of other options that, we, that I mentioned yesterday that we're working on that you may not be uh, aware of. Um, uh, with COVID and the inability of uh, people to travel and get visas, um, some faculty are agreeing to mentor students in Georgia to work on a project of mutual interest where the students are enrolled, stay enrolled at a Georgian, in a Georgian PhD program, but are working on a project of interest uh, to their major professor and their mentor at San Diego State. And in that case, our uh, expectation is that the SDSU faculty would pay their Georgian stipend uh, while they're doing that work. And we have some faculty that have uh, uh, expressed an interest and provided topics that could be done remotely that, uh, that are of mutual interest. Um, the other option that we've talked about um, is working with an SDSU faculty member on the research component. Um, and this is intended for students that are matriculated in Georgia, but for whatever reason, um, maybe the time consideration um, or uh, cost consideration, but would come and do their research at San Diego State with a faculty member uh, but would have their degree from the Georgian institution. So in that case, the assumption is that the, the internship could be anything from, you know, six months to two years or, you know, whatever is agreed on. Uh, their stipend in the U.S. would be paid uh, from the major professor. Uh, there would be a mutual benefit in that it's a shorter, the European programs are shorter than the same than uh, U.S. programs. Um, and um, the support from the major professor or the mentor in, at San Diego State would just be during the period that they're working on the project in San Diego. 
So these are all things that we're working on. Um, oh, I should also mention that yesterday, uh, Ms. Nino Chalidze mentioned that there is a international fellowship program for Georgian students to study abroad. And uh, chemistry, you may know, has worked out um, a system where that those funds offset the most of the extra cost of international tuition. So the cost to the program here and the major professor would be the same as for a domestic student. There would be would not be an extra cost for a uh, international student. So this sort of levels the playing field a bit in accepting a uh, a Georgian student compared to a domestic student. So there are a number of options. If students are interested in exploring any of those, um, they uh, should contact uh, the program they're interested in and or me and or uh, Dean Guven and we'll, um, you know, we'll develop and explore those, those paths. Yeah, and I should also mention, we, are, we had a couple of discussion on a similar type of arrangement with a university in South Africa and then a, a university in Italy, uh, an Italian university. So I, I think right now, the mechanisms we have, you know, we are partnering with another institution to bring into picture another institution and the grant degree uh, is not there. So what was discussed, in fact, we did also involve uh, the Office of International Affairs is to have some sort of a memorandum of understanding with those two other institutions. So I, I think we need to explore one. You know, it, it is rather than a program to program, it could be maybe a university wide. Yes, we are you know, already working with SDSU Georgia, but if you want to bring our Georgian institutions, maybe we should work on that way so that it is, you know, uh, not, it, it is the same for all the JDP programs rather than a computational science and uh, another institution or engineering another institution. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to see the level of enthusiasm um, by you and your college and we'll, uh, uh, I, I think that's an excellent suggestion. We'll be in contact, with, you know, forward on it. Uh, I think we may have time for another question or two, Nodar. No, I think it would be good to move and have a, another speaker and we can have the all the questions and answers later. If you okay. Want all right. Well, thank you um, very much, Roma. That was a great introduction to the engineering program. I, I know I learned some things and uh, Lodar for handling the questions um, and discussion so far. So with that, I would like to introduce our last speaker, um, for uh, today, um, she'll speak on, um, similarly, she'll speak on three programs, um, I believe in at least two programs in public health. Uh, speaking is uh, Dr. Heather Corliss, who is the uh, co-director of, uh, of, um, of behavioral sciences, I believe, and we'll talk on, on global health as well. Heather, are you there? And you should have be able to share your screen. Okay. Uh, thank you, Walter. Um, hello, everyone. Delighted to be here this, uh, this morning. I guess it's evening time at your place um, to discuss our joint um, doctoral program with SDSU and UCSD in public health. So I'm going to um, share my screen and start the PowerPoint presentation. Okay. okay, can everyone see the presentation in my screen? Yeah, looks good. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Great. So um, just to give a brief history of um, our, our joint doctoral program in public health, um, we have three tracks. 
there's the epidemiology track, the health behavior track, and the global health track. So the epidemiology track is our oldest track. It was established in um, 1990. Health behavior was established in 2004, came second, and um, we graduated over 40 graduates since then. And the JDP in global health um, was started in 2007. It's the first PhD um, program in global health in the United States, and they've graduated over 30 graduates. So as I mentioned before, it's a partnership between the School of Public Health at San Diego State University and the Department of Family Medicine and Public Health and the Division of Infectious Diseases and Global Public Health in the Department of Medicine at UCSD. UCSD is currently starting their own uh, School of Public Health. And so um, there will be a, a transition in the affiliation and the relationship. Um, on the UCSD side, it will be a collaboration between two schools of public health once um, the UCSD School of Public Health is established. And they're currently establishing that right now. So in terms of the administration of the program, we have um, directors or co-directors on each side. Um, so I am the co-director of the public health program um, at SDSU and Dr. David Strong is the co-director on the UCSD side. And here are our emails if you have any additional follow-up questions. Each um, university also has a coordinator so on the UCSD side, the coordinator is Carrie Goldsmith. And on the SDSU side, the coordinator is Brad Hubbard. And so within the tracks, there are um, co-directors for each track. So in terms of the health behavior track, both David, Dr. Strong and myself um, are the co-directors for health behavior. In terms of the co-directors for the epidemiology track, that would, is Rick Schaefer on the SDSU side and Andrea LaCroix on the UCSD side. And the co-directors for the global health track um, is Elizabeth Reed at SDSU and Kimberly Brower at UCSD. So I'm gonna go into a little more detail about the um, health behavior track. So the focus of the health behavior program, um, graduates of the program are expected to have the following advanced skills, um, behavior change theories and strategies for population application, qualitative and quantitative research methods, and the application of interventions and research methods to health behavior in disenfranchised or underrepresented um, populations that experience health disparities. Um, and then to understand and to change, be able to change and affect the change of health policy. So the specific requirements for the health behavior track. Um, sorry, it's hard for me to see chat when um, I have my screen sharing, but I see people are chat are asking maybe some questions. I don't know. Oh, uh, don't don't worry about that. Now, Heather, we'll have um, question and answer at the end, and we can forward any questions we don't get to that in that period. So, okay. So, yeah, just, just, ignore, just ignore the chat. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Zoom, Zoom is still challenging me. So, uh, okay, so um, in terms of the specific requirements for the health behavior track, um, we have coursework in health behavior and theory, program planning and evaluation, epidemiology, biostatistics, scientific writing, professional development, and other classes in research methods such as grant writing, um, behavioral measurement, data analysis, and then we have some electives as well. Um, we have a series of um, practicum training, three quarters, applied critical thinking, um, that's on the use on the SDS, on the UCSD side, theory and data analysis to a particular behavioral health issue of interest. Um, our, um, our doctoral um, 
students can assist in terms of um, being a TA for um, undergraduate courses or master's level courses. Occasionally, our, our advanced doctoral level courses also teach courses, um, undergraduate courses, both uh, on both campuses. So there's ample opportunity to teach. Um, and so in terms of the required courses for year one, um, this all of this is available on our website. Um, so I'm not going to go into all the details. Um, but as I mentioned before, in, in the fall quarter, um, uh, students take epidemiologic methods or advanced epidemiologic methods, depending on their um, background and training in epidemiology. They take um, advanced statistics. They take advanced theoretical foundations in health promotion and behavioral science. Uh, they, they take a seminar on research methods and a class on um, applications of um, soft statistical software programs to biostatistical concepts. So they take either SAS or R or SPSS, depending on um, customizing to their needs. And in the spring, um, they take applications in multivariate statistics. It's a second um, advanced stat class. They take behavioral measurement and they take the seminar in grant writing and health behavior. And then they get to choose um, an elective with a mentor's advice. Um, sometimes it can be an independent study with um, like another faculty person as well. Um, in terms of, so the first, first year students are on the SDSU campus, and then the second year they go to the, uh, UC, the UCSD campus. And um, SDSU has a, has a semester system, UCSD has a quarter system. And so the, the structure of the courses on the UCSD side look a little different. Um, the, the students take um, their doctoral seminar, um, they take scale development where they learn about uh, IRT um, and advanced scale development. Um, they take health behavior interventions. Um, they take, and in the second quarter, in the winter quarter, they take um, health policy as well as a continuing of the practicum and the doctoral seminar. With the practicum, they, they actually, it's very applied. They write a, um, a manuscript for publication and they do data an analysis. And then in the spring, they also take uh, clinical trials and experimental design, and they also have the option to choose electives. So in, um, in the health behavior track, um, students that come in are paired with um, an advisor, like an advisory committee. So they, they might have a main advisor, and then they have a couple other um, faculty that are on their advisory committee. And they generally meet with their advisor or their committee um, there's some flexibility monthly in the first year. Most students work part-time with advisors and um, research teams. Um, there's more information about the website um, for the health behavior track. Um, and I would say that our graduate program, uh, graduates of our program are competitive for a variety of um, research, teaching, and community service positions and academic institutions, um, local and state health departments, uh, federal and international agencies, and private and public um, research institutions. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, ep epidemiology track. The focus of the ep epidemiology program um, is on identification of risk factors for diseases and condi conditions that affect human populations. The emphasis of the epidemiology track is on producing graduates with a mastery of the central concepts and analytic processes of epidemiology for application to a multitude of disciplines. Specializations are offered through both campuses, um, such as infectious and chronic disease, exercise science, medical geography, and behavioral epidemiology. Uh, we even have like um, an expanding program in, in digital health too that um, EPI as well, all, all three tracks have the opportunity to be involved in that as well. Uh, okay, so in terms of the specific um, requirements for the epidemiology track, coursework emphasi emphasizes epidemiology and biostats. Um, 
scientific, they also have scientific writing, professional de development and electives. Um, they do an independent st study. They work with their program faculty member and design a course of independent study uh, research as an elective. Um, they, they take a lot of data analysis programming um, courses um, to demonstrate proficiency in at least two statistical computer packages. Um, they, in terms of the exams, there's a preliminary exam in epidemiology and a preliminary exam in, in biostatistics um, that is separate from their, um, their um, dissertation. So they also do teaching our ep uh, epidemiology students. Um, they help faculty um, teaching courses in epidemiology or biostats at either institution. So here's the um, required course um, schedule for the epidemiology um, track. Um, most of the applicants come in um, with master's degrees in epidemiology. Um, or um, after completing equivalent coursework in epidemiology. Um, so uh, 39 total semester equivalent units, 28 in advanced epidemiology and 11 in biostatistics. Um, so in the, um, there, so then um, on the SDSU, it's kind of organized a little bit differently for epidemiology. Um, the methodology courses that they take is epidemiological methods, advanced methods in epidemiology, and then on the UCSD campus, they take applied epidemiology, uh, three quarters. Um, in terms of their, the seminar, the kind of professional development seminar, there's the doctoral seminar, um, and then they also have a lecture series on the UCSD side. Um, they, they take two methods courses from the following options, a clinical trials, issues, and dilemma uh, on the UCSD campus. And on the SDSU campus, there's Modern Epi Epidemiology Methods 1 and Modern Epidemiology Methods 2. It's a year-long um, course. Um, they take multivariate statistics. Um, they take statistical analysis, software programming, um, and, and then they um, choose in terms of their biostatistics courses, applied regression, analysis of clinical trials, analysis of case control studies, and analysis of cohort studies. So they have to take a minimum of two, but um, sometimes um, students take more than that. Um, so an epidemiolo epidemiology research exchange conference is also something that the students are expected to participate in. Um, they partner with the San Diego County Health Department and the Naval Health Research Center to host a conference on local epidemiological research and all the students present um, and um, attend. So as far as their advisor, um, um, they, they, are, they are matched up with, with an advisor um, on either the UCSD or the SDSU campus. Um, and like all the tracks, they, um, they tend to work part-time with, with their advisor. Um, and similar to the other tracks, the graduates um, uh, generally are in careers um, in academic settings, um, teaching, research institutions, government agencies, as well as the private sector. So now focusing a little bit more on the global health um, JDP um, program, the focus of the, J the JDP and global health is to prepare leaders and researchers in academia and public health practice who work to solve health problems that transcend borders, recognize the principles of social, social justice and health equity is a key basis for their work and acknowledge the value of cross-cultural learning and practice health diplomacy in the pursuit of global peace and development. Coursework in global health is, is similar um, in some senses to the other tracks, epidemiology, biostatistics, scientific writing, grant writing, things like that. Um, global health, but the global health JDP curriculum also allows students to integrate their individual areas of focus with electives and independent studies. Um, many of them do um, these things internationally or globally. 
Um, and there's um, students from diverse training backgrounds and interests. Um, so it's a, a multidisciplinary group of students with focus in environmental health, health policy, sociology, psychology, basic sciences. Um, they do a mentored field practic practicum, uh, which is a minimum of one to two months. Um, it, it can be in the US, um, but generally, you know, it, it, it's dealing with a global health topic. Um, it might be um, border issues or something like that. And then um, like the other tracks, they also have the opportunity to TA and teach. So here's the, the coursework for year one SDSU for global um, health. They take the global health one. They take a professional seminar and public health um, course, a global health practicum. And then they take program planning and evaluation. Um, in terms of, um, so it looks like there's a bit more flexibility in the global health to customize with electives. Um, there's maybe less requirements in global health than the other two tracks. Um, so then on the year two side, uh, on the UCSD side year two, um, they take lecture series um, courses, cultural perceptions of health and disease, and then their practicum, uh, which is sort of a scientific analysis and writing. Um, the advisor is, is generally the uh, core faculty at UCSD or SDSU or a combination, um, you know, I'd say like all three tacks, most, um, most of the students meet at least monthly, if, if not more, if they're working directly um, with the faculty in terms of their research. Um, there's a website link there. Um, there's also opportunities to take coursework abroad, um, field opportunities um, in Baja, California through the VDI program. There's classes in Costa Rica, Colombia, India, Peru, and Uganda. Uganda. Um, okay, so um, in terms of um, just kind of a little bit more information about the structure of the program. Um, so after the students complete all their coursework, um, then they're focusing on advancing to, to candidacy. Um, so they complete their course work, any teaching requirements and field or practicum um, requirements. And then their, their initial advisory committee then um, transitions to their um, dissertation, uh, their, well, their qualifying exam committee. So it may be the, the, the three people that they, or two or three people they got um, matched with um, in the beginning of the program. Sometimes it varies, um, it, 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 it evolves to a different group of people depending on the student's needs. Um, and in terms of the qualifying exam, the students um, write a grant application um, and a comprehensive review and a white paper. Um, so they select a committee, um, three, three for the qualifying and five for the dissertation um, from both campuses. Uh, and then the students um, write their their dissertation proposals. Um, you know, after they um, after they finish their qualifying exam requirements, then they then they um, it, propose their dissertation. Um, and they propose it in oral format with their five committee members um, that they have um, put together. And then um, that proposal gets approved by the um, dissertation committee, and then um, they advance to doing their dissertation work. And generally, um, the, they have the option to do, students have the option to do a traditional dissertation, um, or they have an option to do a three article dissertation. And at the end of finishing their dissertation, they do uh, the oral defense, um, and hopefully that gets approved and then they go on to graduate and have their um, PhD in the JDP. Um, so in terms of tuition and stipend support, um, we seek tuition waivers um, from California residents, for California residents. Um, um, 
and can apply for fellowships to cover uh, tuition for non-residents. So generally we are able to get um, uh, tuition waivers for, for non-residents um, as well, and that includes international students. We, we have a strong commitment um, in the program to um, supporting international students, to, to accepting international students. All of our uh, tracks every year have international students. Um, and, and generally the students get stipend support um, from their faculty mentors, um, and some they also have the opportunity to get fellowships. Um, through both SDSU and UCSD, um, and they can support themselves also through uh, teaching assistantships and also teaching classes. Um, and then a lot of our applicants um, write dissertation fellowships and receive um, grants to do their dissertation work. So in terms of other in information, um, the class sizes for each track ranges from about four to eight students. Um, so it's a small program, but it's not so small that the um, students don't feel like they're part um, of a program. Um, there's often cross um, communication and connection between students um, that are in the different tracks. And then also within the track, there's a, a nice cohort um, for social support. And generally our students graduate in about four to five years. That's the goal. Um, okay, I think I've said all of this, um, except for the one thing you know that, I, that I'd like to maybe end on is that, um, and maybe you've heard about this in, uh, through other programs um, that, that you've learned about today, that the students have access to resources, um, both at SDSU and UCSD they have access to, you know, a large, diverse um, group of faculty at both institutions. Um, and I think that the students really see that as a, as a benefit of our program. So if you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out to me um, for health behavior, um, reach out to Rick Schaefer for epidemiology and uh, reach out to Elizabeth Reed, uh, Liz Reed um, for global health. You can find out all of our, all this information as well out on the website and you can find a lot more information on the website. So if you're interested in the program, you know, please go to our website and um, learn more about it. Thank you very much, Heather. That was a great, uh, great overview uh, and I appreciate it. Uh, if you can stay with us, uh, we'll have a question and answer period in addition to people contacting you and others directly. Um, the question and answers are being handled. I should have introduced uh, Dr. Sergaletsi uh, before. Uh, he's the Director of Tertiary Education with the Millennium Foundation. And he's been, um, he intervened earlier to handle the questions and answers and we'll, we'll uh, do that now. Thanks, Nodar. Nodar. Uh, uh, thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Cortles, for your uh, wonderful presentation. A couple of questions came from the audience and First question is, who are typical students of your program? Students from the chemistry background, from the biology or the others? Is there any restriction for, for students to apply or not? Um, so I would say, uh, you know, probably a lot of our students um, come from, a pub, they might have uh, MPHs um, in a public health degree, um, whether it's um, policy or health, you know, community health or epidemiology. We have um, students from um, exercise science and nutrition, and they might have um, physical therapy degrees. Um, we have students who are, um, have backgrounds in, in psychology and sociology. Uh, we do have students that have backgrounds in um, the more harder sciences, um, biology for sure. Uh, we have students who have backgrounds in computational science. Um, 
that want to apply that to public health. Um, so I think it varies, but I think, oh, I think we definitely have students from the humanities as well, but generally what we, those, the students who, we want the students to have some public health um, coursework. Um, and so like on our website, we, we have courses that we recommend that students take or similar type courses before um, coming into our program. And so what I would, rec I would say is that for students who are in um, disciplines that aren't encompassed within public health, um, that, you know, that it, we would recommend that they, they take some courses um, that are kind of foundational public health courses. We also have students in like a uh, anthropology as well, backgrounds. Thank you. And from today and from the yesterday's uh, seminars, uh, is the issue of no, uh, PhD programs accept students with bachelor degrees. While in Georgia, there's a mandatory for students to have a master's degree to apply for the PhD programs. Is your program exception or is the same for like other programs? Do you accept these bachelor students or not? Um, we do. We do accept bachelor students. Um, we, we look at the student, the applicant holistically. And so, you know, we, we, we do have a lot of students who have been professionals in the field for many, many years and that want to go back to school. Um, they might be professionals in different countries. You know, they might be working um, in health ministries. You know, for people like that, it, 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 uh, they probably have more knowledge and training than someone with a, a master's degree who uh, it hasn't worked out in the field. And so we, we look at um, people's backgrounds holistically. Um, they're not necessarily re required to have an MPH, um, certainly, or to have a master's degree. I mean, certainly it doesn't hurt. Um, and um, like, you know, we have noticed that, uh, you know, some of our, um, our students with just bachelor's degrees who have limited um, exposure to public health, they, they have to work harder to, to um, kind of manage the program. One question came related to the financial side of the program, which you covered in your presentation. And you mentioned that financial aids are available for the international students as well. But what's the typical tuition for on your programs? So is it the same? Is it like a flat rate for all uh, PhD programs at SDSU or it's varies from program to program? Um, I think it's my understanding that it's pretty similar, uh, that the tuition is the same across um, programs. I most of our um, students come in with, um, you know, tuition waivers and tuition supports. So we, we work to guarantee um, support, financial support for, for the applicants that we um, accept into the program. Um, you know, sometimes the, the support that they do receive, uh, it varies from student to student. Um, like some students, you know, only, you know, primarily work as um, graduate student researchers with their, their mentors that work on different studies, their advisors and others, um, you know, spend a lot of time uh, getting support, financial support through uh, t teaching and being a uh, teaching assistant. Um, there's, there's because there's opportunities on two campuses. We we work hard um, to to find funding for the students and support for the students, so they generally don't have to pay tuition. Like for example, if they're TAs on the um, UCSD side, um, then um, they, they get that, that everything's covered, even their health insurance. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I would say that, that you know, t that the tuition is, it, it's def it's bureaucratic and it's on the books and it exists, but, but we work really hard um, as directors to, to find um, tuition waivers and support and support, financial support for that. Uh, thank you. And one common, you know, request from the audience is to have a possibility to, to get your presentation, if we can have sure. that to share. 
You want me Thank to you. just have the PowerPoint slides? Is that yeah. If it's possible, if you can send to the San Diego, Georgia office, Anna Tonikiani is the contact person, and later we can share with the audience all the presentations made. So, well, there is no more questions, so we can mention about the topics of tomorrow's presentation to audience world, also because many of them might be interested having listening this today's presentation to have the possibility to listen to others as well. And it would be good to mention those. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Nodar, for doing that. Um, uh, the speakers, you may, uh, I needed to compress my PowerPoint um, uh, to make it small enough to email. We could also do a Dropbox, but I think it's fine if you compress it to uh, print quality. Um, so I'd like to thank all the speakers today. Um, it was really um, a good coverage of these programs and the participants for <laughs> persisting late into the evening at, in Georgia. Um, tomorrow we'll cover the remaining topics. The, um, um, and you're all invited to attend tomorrow as well. Um, this will be language and communication disorders. Uh, math and science education, clinical psychology, physical therapy, and education. Um, so I have a general education leadership uh, PhD program um, presented and also math and science education uh, presented. So um, I hope to see at least some of you tomorrow and I uh, thank you all for attending. And again, I, I thank our presenters and uh, and Nodar for handling the questions. Um, have a good what's left of your evening. We will see you, bye. Thank you very much, bye. Thank you.